The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is liberty nation with tim donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty liberty nation with Tim Donner. Cops killed an unarmed black man in Minnesota. Trump and Twitter go to war. The COVID death toll hit six figures. China annexes Hong Kong. We'll search for good news from the week as hard as we can, folks, but it's not going to be easy. Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production, as always, of LibertyNation.com and heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Americans are trying to come to grips with the latest horrific episode of police confronting an unarmed black man and executing him slowly and deliberately, it appears. We'll sort that out as best we can. While Twitter tries to put the boot on President Trump and Trump fights back with an explosively controversial executive order. China pulls the curtain down on the Hong Kong we know as it continues to take a beating from the world for letting COVID-19 spread for weeks before alerting the world. We'll be joined in our analysis of all this by a trio of big timers from LibertyNation.com. Legal Affairs Editor Scott Cosenza, defense and national security expert Dave Patterson, and socio-political correspondent Jeff Charles. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. We commence the proceedings with our signature segment, Say What?, where we roll out a virtual assembly line of wacky, astonishing, damnable, and ultimately revealing things uttered by politicians and the chattering class in what may be among the most damnable episodes we have ever witnessed. The nation has recoiled in horror in the wake of another racially charged incident, but this time almost nobody is defending the police after one cop in Minneapolis shifted his full body weight onto his knee and pressed it down on the neck of a prostrate George Floyd as horrified onlookers begged him to stop until Mr. Floyd died right there or on his way to the hospital. And the three other cops in on the arrest did nothing to stop him. This in the progressive bastion of Minneapolis, where you'd expect the police to be far more constrained given the progressive nature of that city. With the release now of multiple videos of that incident, we're starting to get a clearer picture on how Mr. Floyd was executed by police for an alleged non-violent crime. It starts at 8 p.m. at this grocery store. Police are called because Floyd was suspected of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. 8.34, cops find Floyd in an SUV parked nearby and handcuff him. Surveillance video from a restaurant shows Floyd is not resisting as he's removed from the SUV. 38. He is marched across the street by two officers. Several missing minutes go by without video. The timeline picks up when a passerby begins shooting video of a cop with his knee pressed into Floyd's neck. Floyd can be heard telling the cops he cannot breathe 15 times. The gathering crowd can see Floyd is unconscious. Bro, he has not moved, not one time. That's from the TV show Inside Edition. So, how severe is pressing your knee on the neck of someone lying face down on the ground? Forensic pathologist Dr. Judy Melanick. Pressure on the neck can make someone unconscious within seconds and then kill them on the order of minutes. What we see in the video is that there is pressure put on his neck for at least four minutes before he becomes unconscious. 
Rest assured, there will be hell to pay for this, for cops, for communities torn by violent outrage about this, for ordinary people appalled by this incident. Four cops, one slowly draining the life out of a nonviolent suspect, the others standing by and watching. We'll talk more about this with LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza later in the show. But it was another week, so of course there was another raging controversy over President Trump after he fired back at Twitter, which for the first time had fact-checked a political ad, his, saying mail-in voting will lead to massive voter fraud. Obviously an opinion, the type perpetuated all over Twitter every hour of every day, But this is Trump, so a brand new standard is set. But not to be outdone, Trump laid down an executive order demanding impartiality from Twitter. Today I'm signing an executive order to protect and uphold the free speech and rights of the American people. Currently, social media giants like Twitter receive an unprecedented liability shield based on the theory that they're a neutral platform. My executive order calls for new regulations under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act to make it that social media companies that engage in censoring or any political conduct will not be able to keep their liability shield. Liability shield means Twitter and other social media sites have protection from lawsuits because they're only posting content from their users not posting it themselves. So, is Twitter's actions a legitimate threat to free speech, or is Trump's? Or is this just a shot across the bow from Trump and or an attempt to get Twitter to bend? We'll talk that over with Mr. Cosenza later on as well. Meanwhile, life goes on as we pass the 100,000 death mark from COVID-19, And the nation starts to get its mojo back with partial and some full reopenings across the land, in spite of apparent desire by leftists in general and blue state governors in particular to keep us shuttered. But President Trump still has a reelection campaign to run over the next five months, and he made another one of those bold claims this week. Now, last week on the show, we discussed Trump's claims that we have prevailed over COVID-19 and that his is one of the greatest presidencies in history. This week, Trump made a pitch for why he needs a second term to fight for what he has discovered is the true enemy of the American people. I'm fighting the deep state. I'm fighting, uh, I'm fighting the swamp. And I said I was doing it, and I'm exposing the swamp. I think if it keeps going the way it's going... I have a chance to break the deep state. It's a vicious group of people. It's very bad for our country. They never thought I was going to win, and then I won. And then they tried to get me out. That was the insurance policy. She's going to win, but just in case she doesn't win, we have an insurance policy. And now I beat them on the insurance policy. And now they're being exposed. That was from an interview with Cheryl Atkinson on the show, Full Measure. The response of the deep state known until Trump as the permanent bureaucracy, is likely to be exactly what it's been for three-plus years of the Trump presidency. Over our dead bodies, we will outlast you and reestablish our credibility and dominance as soon as Trump leaves and is replaced by a Democrat or perhaps a weak-willed Republican. But the contrast between Trump and his presumptive opponent, Joe Biden, could not have been more stark this week. While Trump eschewed the mask in public appearances as he tried to pump up the reopening of the country, Joe Biden finally left his basement and visited a war memorial with his wife on Memorial Day, wearing an ominous-looking black mask, which triggered the expected back and forth. Biden can wear a mask, but he was standing uh, outside with his wife, perfect conditions, perfect weather. They're inside, they don't wear masks, and so I thought it was very unusual that he had one on. He's a fool, an absolute fool to talk that way. I mean, every leading doc in the world is saying we should wear a mask when you're in a crowd. But Biden wasn't in a crowd. He was just with his wife. 
Nevertheless, Biden in his black mask, while Trump refuses to wear a mask in public, presents the perfect imagery for the two sides. Republicans desperately wanting to kickstart people's lives in the economy. Democrats pushing for lockdowns until, well, how about Election Day? That'll work. But Biden spent much of the week backtracking and apologizing for what he said to podcaster Charlemagne the God. I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black. Was Biden taking the black vote for granted or just, as he said, being a wise guy? We'll talk that over with Liberty Nation's Jeff Charles in the next segment. But among the things uppermost in the minds of most in the political class, not to mention everyday Americans, is China. And this week, the Chinese Communist Party doubled down on its tyranny, effectively ending Hong Kong as an independent state and folding it into the People's Republic of China. As National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said, this is a seismic shift for global markets. It's hard to see how Hong Kong could remain the Asian financial center that it's become if China takes over. One reason that they came to Hong Kong is because there was the rule of law there. There was a free enterprise system. There was a capitalist system. There was democracy and local legislative elections. If all those things go away, I'm not sure how the financial community can stay there. And I think you're also going to have a terrible brain drain. I think Hong Kong uh, citizens, many of whom uh, can travel uh, under certain circumstances, could travel to the United Kingdom or, or seek refuge other places, they're not going to stay in Hong Kong to be dominated by the, the People's Republic of China. We'll drill down on what's ahead and what's going to change in our relationship with China when we're joined by LibertyNation.com defense and national security expert Dave Patterson. But race was on the minds of those paying attention before the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis after the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee stepped in it again, as we played you, when talking about how black people must vote. We'll analyze whether it's a big deal or much ado about nothing when we return. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com. With one click, you get tomorrow's news today. With LNTV's Hot Topics and Analysis, Liberty Nation Radio, The Uprising and Rabbit Hole Podcasts, and dozens of insightful original articles. And now, you can keep your kids ahead of the curve with LNGenZ.com. LNGenZ brings a free-thinking education right into your home for students of every grade level with articles, videos, worksheets, and ready-to-go curricula. While the media establishment giants are sleeping, you can stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com. We believe that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. So Joe Biden stepped in it recently, not that that's anything new, but this time he might have inflamed his most important voters, his base, the people he needs to show up in big numbers supporting him on November 3rd. He said, as we played in the first segment, that if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, you ain't black. Almost as if he himself was black, which he most decidedly is not. Joining us to analyze whether this big dust-up was truly damaging to the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee or merely a tempest in a teapot sure to be ignored by the elite media is the man who schools us on the cross-section of culture and politics, LibertyNation.com socio-political correspondent, Mr. Jeff Charles. Welcome back, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure now. Jeff, if you're not voting for me over Trump, you ain't black. Half of me says Joe Biden made a huge mistake acting like he takes the black vote for granted. But the other half of me says he was just being what he said, a wise guy making a flippant remark. Which are you buying and why? I'm buying both of those. See, but here's here's one thing where I'll push back on you a little bit. He said acting like he takes the black vote for granted. 
No, he's not acting. He does take the black vote for granted, which is what the Democrats have done uh, for for decades. And realistically, I mean, I, it's hard to blame them when they've had 90, 80, 90 percent of the black vote for, for, for decades. Jeff, explain to me why Joe Biden seems to be so popular among black people. Is it just because he was Obama's vice president? I think that's part of it, but I don't think that explains all of it. I think Biden prevent, uh, pre- presents a, um, a sense of familiarity, a sense of normalcy. On top of that, I mean, um, about 60, 65 percent of black voters consider themselves to be moderate or conservative. So there's a very small percentage that are actually let way to the far left. So when it comes to the field of Democratic uh, nominees during the primaries, He's the one that they were going to gravitate uh, gravitate to in the first place. Now, Jeff, on one side, you have Biden's long support from the NAACP and his voting record on civil rights. On the other, you have his support for the infamous crime bill in the 1990s, which incarcerated an awful lot of black people. He was the author, one of the authors and champions of that bill, which had a devastating impact on the black community. It helped the, the, war, the war on drugs, which disproportionately affected black Americans, despite the fact that black Americans don't commit drug crimes more than anybody else. So he has a lot to answer for there, but he's not going to be held to account for it. The left wants to wants to beat Trump. So if pictures show up of Joe Biden wearing blackface and a Klan hood, they're still going to support him. OK, I think you've made your point in as stark a term as possible. Now, I want to go back to something that you said, which we've discussed before, which is that in describing themselves, a majority of black people call themselves conservative, and yet they vote in numbers usually over 90 percent for the Democratic presidential candidate. Over the past 60 years, uh, the Republican Party has not made a concerted effort to reach black voters. Now, Trump is starting to do that. But here's the thing. Throughout the history, since the Republican Party was formed, there has been a bit of a back and forth. And when Democrats or when black people started voting more Democrat, when Eisenhower took over, he was convinced to do at least some outreach to the black community. And when he did that and when his 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 campaign team did that, They almost doubled the amount of black support that they had received previously when Eisenhower was first elected. Now, as you've said, President Trump has made really an unprecedented effort for a Republican to reach black voters or the biggest effort since the 1950s. How much of a difference do you see this making in the black vote, which uh, Trump got 8 percent of in 2016? Yeah, those are all factors that will work in his favor. Um, I think the COVID-19 situation might put a little hurt on that. But I think overall, just the fact that he's even trying, I think that's going to get him more than what he had before. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure how much of an increase that'll be, but I, I think he has a good chance of getting over 10%. And a lot of that, too, is because Joe's voter enthusiasm is in the toilet. Like, people who support him aren't very excited about it, whereas with Trump, people are more excited. Well, I wrote a piece last week on LibertyNation.com about that enthusiasm gap. 18-point difference between Democrats excited about this election and Republicans, and that's 18 points in Trump's favor. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Jeff Charles, socio-political correspondent for LibertyNation.com. Quick break, and then we're back to discuss how things will change with China. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours, the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. These last dreadful months suffering through the COVID-19 pandemic have accomplished at least one thing we'll take forward into the future. You cannot trust China, a country many people associate with industry manufacturing, but at base, it's a nation run by communists foisting upon the world the belief that you can have a form of economic freedom accompanied by none 
of the political freedoms we enjoy, free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. And we have witnessed the wreckage strewn across the global landscape after China discovered the coronavirus, protected themselves while continuing to send their people out across the world before they finally admitted how serious the virus was six weeks later, at which point the world was being forced to shut down. We know Americans are in a rage about China and that things are going to change when this virus has finally run its course. But in what ways? Well, President Trump has released an entirely new strategy on this beast from the East. And here to tell us about it is LibertyNation.com's defense and national security expert, Dave Patterson. Dave, welcome back to the radio show. Thank you, Tim. Great to be with you. Pleasure to have you back. Now, I want people to know about what China is really like, about their state-controlled media, their persecution of religious minorities. And now this week, their virtual annexing of Hong Kong, shattering the one country, two systems principle that had protected Hong Kong since it was handed back to China by the British. Because, Dave, we're in a highly teachable moment right now. Almost two-thirds of Americans now have an unfavorable view of China about double the number when the year began. And once we finish our conversation today, that number will likely be higher. Now, in your recent article on LibertyNation.com entitled New Strategic Approach U.S.-China Relations Under the Microscope, you wrote about how the Trump administration released the new United States strategic approach to the People's Republic of China. And you said this official document is more on point and timelier than any seen in decades. It's impressive. How so? Well, Tim, I think that it, it's impressive and it's timely because of its specific. It deals with the three areas in which we are challenged by China. Economically, it's a challenge to our values, and it's a security challenge. Economically, you know, we hoped for a reform within China when they came into the WTO, and it simply has not been realized. They still have their same predatory policies, and they are non-market mercantilistic approach to trade. And they steal economic uh, or uh, intellectual property, and they have this demand for technological transfer before doing business with them. And the Chinese activities in the South China Sea, for example— the harassment of Malaysian oil platforms. The Chinese Communist Party continues to push for a defense buildup. Now, you also write that what was anticipated to be a convergence of the People's Republic of China's rapid economic development and increased engagement with the world and a citizen-centric free and open order has not happened. Just the opposite has been the case. Explain what you mean. Well, it's just exactly that. That's what the uh, the China strategy points out. Rapid economic development of uh, China has allowed them to increase their predatory practices in the world. And uh, what we thought was going to uh, be a coming together of like and common purposes, and like thinking in the world of uh economics just simply has not happened. We believe in a rules-based approach uh, to free trade, and that's simply not what China is doing. They want a, a, what I call uh, ideology-based uh, economic principles, which are antithetical to the way we think of things. It seems to me that people are wishing for something out of China that they're never going to get, which is a spirit of global cooperation. Is it fair to say that the Chinese are bent based on their actions over decades? They're bent not on global cooperation, but on global dominance. That's absolutely right. I mean, everything they do is pointed in that direction. And uh, I don't think that we can expect uh, any different. I mean, it's been this way since 1948. And um, I think that, as we always say, you know, you know, hope is not a strategy, and it's certainly not that in this case. Now, you talk about this national security strategy we've had these over the years, but unlike the 
national security strategy. This one, this new plan by Trump focuses on China independently rather than as part of an aggregate of global competitors. Now, the old view of the PRC is out, and a and, and you write that a more clear-eyed assessment of the Chinese Communist Party's intentions and actions is in. Now, Dave, how would you expect China to fight back against this new order being promoted by the Trump administration? Well, I think that China will continue to do what they've been doing. But there is a very specific uh, phrase in the strategy, which I kind of like. And it says that the U.S. will have more tolerance for a bilateral friction with China. I take that to mean that we're not going to put up with uh, being second fiddle to China, both militarily and economically, and that we will assert our prerogatives and our our rights in uh, throughout the world. But China will not change. They have a three warfares approach to a three warfare strategy. It's a psychological. It relies on using the legal system to get what they want and also media uh, or what they call public opinion warfare. And we have to be vigilant in all three of those areas. Now, referring to the globalist vision of the left, which includes a a wonderful relationship of friendship and mutual cooperation with China, you write. No one is confused by the Platonesque sounding phrases like building a community of common destiny for mankind. But it does bring to mind a utopian experience. Think about it. A community of common destiny, not just for a few or thousands, but for all mankind. Wow. You lingering flower children of the 60s, you're thinking, where do I sign up? But just a minute, the China strategy explains what the words really mean. So what do they really mean? Well, when you have uh, these really nice sounding words, what it means is that China dominates. China dominates economically. China dominates politically. China dominates in the media. And once you realize that, then life will be awesome, not just for a few, but for all mankind. Oh, it's not. It's it's it's, it's inspiring. Oh, uh, Dave, it's so inspiring. I'm sitting here beaming from ear to ear at the thought of it. You should be. Uh, do you think now now these are these are important questions in terms of the perception of Americans of China. Do you think Americans are really aware that China has a 100 percent state run media, no freedom of the press at all? No, absolutely not. I don't think they have that uh, as an understanding at all. We used to know what that looked like when you looked at Pravda and the Soviet Union. They have not generalized that same way of thinking to the the Chinese uh, media and the Chinese media outlets, the, the Global Times, for example. They don't realize that that is the President Xi speak. And so consequently, you know, they're, they're more likely to believe it. But it's not just the Americans. We have a media that believes that stuff, too. Well, that's an understatement. They're actually purveyors of the message from the left. They're almost as if they're just simply cheerleaders or vessels. Dave, this has been very enlightening, and I'm sure we'll be discussing China a whole lot more going forward. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be with you always. Dave Patterson, defense and national security expert at LibertyNation.com. And after a quick break, we'll return with Talkin' Liberty. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. And now we have reached the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitled Talkin' Liberty, when we examine both threats, many of them, and promising developments, not enough of those, regarding your individual liberty, as we're joined by our guardian of such, our guardian of individual liberty, LibertyNation.com, legal affairs editor, and of course, constitutional lawyer, 
Scott David Cosenza. Hello, wow. Scott. I feel so great wow. now, Tim. Boy. I just want to make sure you give yeah. me a good segment what, so I, I build the, you up, you know, I'm, so I'm you won't let me. make that my alarm on my phone when I, in the morning. If I build you up, then I figure you won't let me down. <laughs> there you go. Well, let's, the nation, uh, the nation, Scott, has been horrified by something that happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota, by the event itself, by the aftermath of it. Take us through what happened and the immediate response both in terms of the community and the country. We're talking about the killing of Mr. Floyd, uh, what looks like the killing of Mr. Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, It's so early, Tim, that I think it's ridiculous to suggest we should do anything other than investigate, put all the the cops on the shelf, to be sure, in terms of um, suspension um, so they're not on the street, But also the idea that they were fired and arrested, uh, it seems like probably the people who did so haven't even examined all the video that has been taken to to, to understand what happened. And maybe you say that the video doesn't need to be examined for the cop who had his knee uh, on Mr. Floyd's neck. But for the other three cops, um, Mm -hmm. it might be helpful to understand what they thought was going on. But, I mean, uh, it's all – at this point, it's all the political pressure that's guiding – Like you say, it's the uh, bonfire of the vanities, right? It really is. It comes out. It's a red ball case, and uh, these politicians will do – uh, you know, they'll do whatever they can to to survive the next sort of 20 minutes. Scott, I fear the day that the cop, at least the cop who put his knee – on Floyd's neck is exonerated because if that happens, I fear there will be open racial warfare in the country. I'm going to have a piece in LibertyNation.com published soon, Tim, that discusses why I believe that William Roddy Bryant, who was arrested for the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, will be released mm-hmm. because of overcharging is his instance. And it's that kind of thing that we need to guard against in terms of, you know, the Twitter mob wants them all charged with first degree murder right away. It's like, well, That may be a bit rich, even in uh, the case where a man has lost his life seemingly under uh, totally needless circumstances. How you get an impartial jury in in a progressive city like Minneapolis with a young progressive uh, and aggressive mayor, I I don't see how you can have a fair trial, really, even at at this point. We're a bit far uh, removed from that. So we're just going to take the long game and just say— one thing is for sure, though, burning down um, just stores and looting and rioting are not the actions of the people who care about civil rights in this country. They're the actions of people who are just taking advantage of lack of uh, enforcement in order to just do what they want. and um, Cutting off their nose despite their face by burning down their own communities. This is, a, it's, this is almost a shocking as the police incident itself. Or the communities of others, by the way. There are plenty yeah, of uh, yeah. suburban white Antifa kids that are downtown uh, acting tough. You bet. Yeah. With their masks on. Of course, Antifa must be on the rise now because everybody's wearing masks. I guess you they, think, you know, right? they could yeah. go out there and say, we finally won the <laughs> argument. Everybody's wearing masks <laughs> like we do. <laughs> Roger that. I don't want to make light of them, but... Okay, so, Scott, President Trump and Twitter have now all but declared war on each other. Twitter, for the first time, applying a fact check to a political ad, Trump's, about mail-in balloting, which was Trump's opinion, not a fact, not presented as such. But now Trump has reacted by signing an executive order which could greatly limit Twitter's ability to fact check and perhaps many other things. Well, more importantly, it's the removal or modification of immunity that they hold under Section 230C of the uh, is it the Communications Decency Act. Um, and, and it just seems like this is a uh, punitive measure that Donald Trump is visiting upon Twitter because uh, he didn't like the way they behaved towards his account. And it really smacks him of the worst kind of impulse uh, that a person in power can have, which is to, to use their power uh, to to punish people who annoy and frustrate them rather than uh, for the good of the people. What are the chances that, that this executive order can run the gauntlet of the federal court system when there's real issues of abridgment of free speech at play here? 
Well, almost certainly, Tim. I believe there is a member of the federal judiciary who's willing to impose uh, an intergalactic stay on any enforcement of this kind of uh, ruling, just because we see the way that any Trump initiative has been treated in the federal courts. That's the smart money bet. That said, though, there will be appeals and it'll go forward and, and, and we'll see what the ultimate rulings are. But the likelihood is very small that this will just simply go through, right. um, you know, without a hitch. And we may not get enforcement by the people that need to enforce such an well, executive the order. So, so the enforcement in this instance, Tim, um, it seems to be most of the enforcement will come from executive agencies and the Federal Trade Commission uh, and some others that maybe have like quasi, uh, you know, status. So I wouldn't be so sure. It's not like the FBI is going to be involved. It's going to be a complaint by harassment and the kind of – and this is what makes it kind of really awful, I think, in terms of a civil liberties perspective. These are the kinds of agency fees and fines that you and I would be railing on if it – you know, usually given to some like small business owner who didn't do enough to make sure that somebody didn't wear a mask in a store or just some – Regulations that you and I would think this is the federal government putting a regulation on somebody else. Um, and those types of fees are, you know, they may be easy to beat if you're Twitter and have uh, a high powered law firm uh, behind you. But if it's uh, selling apples on Main Street, good luck. And so for that reason, I think um, it's no comfort uh, for them. Well, it seems to me that tr- what Trump is doing here is sending a shot across the bow at Twitter. He's saying, OK. I'm going to fight back because I never take a punch without giving one back. And he may also be just trying to get Twitter to come to the table and and maybe dial back on some of the excesses of their obvious left wing bias. What the president said turns what you just said on its head. And this is his defense of it. The, the, the quote that he gave before signing the document, we're here today. To defend free speech from one of the greatest dangers is what he's talking about, bias. But, of course, free speech does not apply to private actors. It applies to public speech. Now, before we go, we've got to talk about what's happened in Hong Kong because it's a real tragedy. We've got millions of people in one of the one of the bastions of free market capitalism that's left on the planet. And it's now essentially going to be annexed by the People's Republic of China, which had the one country, two systems for the longest time. And now Hong Kong's basically going to be folded into the broader nation. It looks like it, Tim. Uh, Every at every turn, they tighten their grip on the free. And, you know, you focus on economic terms, which is important. But also we're talking about people who have much more in the way of cultural freedom. Absolutely. Than uh, their fellow countrymen on the main uh, the mainland of China. So all of the art, um, the speech, the news, the day to day is much more free there. And uh, the Chinese government can't abide it. Listen, you you can't have a system where there's those guys get to have freedom, uh, but not these guys. Um, That doesn't work. How can they if if they're the existence of their regime depends on um, using their boot on the neck of uh, the people that they're going to have to do that countrywide? Thank you. Scott. Thanks, Tim. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, where past is prologue, hosted by our own managing editor, Mark Angelides, all available on demand at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. And don't forget about our new Roku channel. So that is it for this week, but we'll be back at you next week. Same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio.